Inspirations, where we give you inspirations to help you spread beauty and joy through your quilting journey. My name is Angel, and today I'm doing a tutorial on English paper piecing, or EPP. EPP is a very old piecing method that uses paper templates. The shapes you can find these templates in are things like triangles, apple cores, clamshells, kites or diamonds, hexagons, anything where those pieces fit just right together, you can probably find yourself a shape. So what do you do with these? Well, there are, uh, you'll, you'll need a pattern, right? So there are a lot of books out there that are written by some very creative people that have written some beautiful patterns to help guide you or inspire you. You can also find free patterns online, just in a little FYI. For this tutorial, I'm going to be using the hexagon. Now the hexagon is very popular, very versatile shape that you'll find within the EPP method. The earliest documented quilt, if my memory can serve me right, that was made with hexagons is somewhere around 1810. Now they do believe that there were probably quilts made with hexagons earlier than that, like in the 1700s, but through time and use and age, they've probably disintegrated. So with this hexagon, I am currently making a grandmother's flower garden wall hanging. <clears throat> I may end up making a quilt instead, but we'll wait and see when I get there. This is a lot of fun, so we're, I may end up making it bigger. The pattern I'm using is called the Grandmother's Flower Garden. And with that pattern, basically you make flowers. And as you can see, you'll find yourself a center hexagon and then a single ring around the center of hexagon and then another ring around that of hexagons. Now I have seen some people just do a single ring around the center and that's fine. It's wherever your inspiration takes you. But because I, when I go back and look at the grandmother's flower garden patterns that were from the 20s, 30s, or 40s, I see a lot of them with double rings. So that's where my inspiration took me. So what else can you make besides a grandmother's flower garden quilt or wall hanging? Well, I've seen people make mug rugs and table runners, placemats. I even saw somebody make a t-shirt. I'm sorry, a shirt, not a t-shirt, but a shirt out of hexagons. It's real, it's true, it's out there. So it's wherever your inspiration takes you or wherever you wanna allow your, your imagination to go. That's what you can do. So what kind of things do you need to make? How do you make these paper templates? Well, I use Fisker's die cuts, okay? This one is the extra large and this one is the large. This measures an inch and I wanna say this one measures half an inch. We measure our hexagons by the sides. So this side's an inch, this side's an inch, we call this an inch hexagon. The smaller sides I actually use, and here's another inspiration, I use it to make Christmas ornaments. But for the, fl the grandmother's flower garden that I'm currently making, I'm, I am using the extra large or the one inch hexagon. Now the paper that you're gonna need is something like cardstock. You could just use cardstock per se. Well, when I first started learning how to do this and I was collecting all the stuff I needed, I bought a lot of index cards, just a lot. So until I run out of these, they work just great. They're stiff enough like cardstock, so that stiffness is important so that you can hold that shape uh, with your paper and, uh, and, and within the fabric. You wanna hold that shape. So that's why that's important. Now, after I run out of these, I've been saving Christmas cards that I, in the past I probably would have thrown away. And I've also been saving advertisements that you get in the mail that feel like that cardstock type paper. Works great. So I've been saving those too. So just a little ideas for you there. I will also tell you that you can purchase pre-cut templates. You can go up to your big box store or on your, your local quilt shop may have some or some places online, I'm sure you could find them on Amazon. I haven't looked, but I'm sure you could. But there are different shapes already pre-cut for you that you could purchase. The next thing you're gonna need are a pair of scissors. Okay, and that's to cut your fabric. I personally do use a thread cutter, thread scissors. They have a little spring load on it, but it's not necessary. You can cut your thread with scissors. You'll also need some pins. To hold that paper to your fabric and the next thing I want to talk about is thread now I'm using two different 
types of thread or kinds or colors or however you want to multiple kinds just different colors the first one really doesn't matter so um, some people do like to try to match their thread still uh, with basting this is used for basting um, the reason is because they're worried that it'll show through the fabric I personally haven't had that happen but it goes through two layers so I'm thinking it will be a little difficult so I haven't had it happen yet so I just use any old thread, any old color. Now the next one is important that you try and match the color of your thread as close as you can to your fabric. The reason is it will help hide those stitches. You'll see that later uh, in, in this tutorial of exactly what I'm talking about. So you wanna try and match as close as you can. The next thing I wanna talk about are needles. You're gonna need needles. This is a hand stitching event. The most popular needles that I have seen are the milliner needles, or some people call them straw needles. Now, a little sidetrack here. I just realized this a couple days ago and it kind of cracked me up. You know we have that saying, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. These are called straw needles. It just kind of cracked me up, I thought it was fun. The most popular milliner needle is that I have seen, a lot of people with EPP like to use the embroider or the fine stitch needle within the milliners and they say that it works really well now the idea is that you get something really thin you could use any old needle if you like but I have learned that the larger the needle the larger the hole which then in turn is harder to hide the stitches so you want to try to find those thin needles now I personally don't use milliner needles I love them but I think I'm a little hard on them I tend to bend them and most recently I even broke one so I kind of stay away but only for that reason they're very good the other the needle that I like to use is the between I think this is a 10 don't quote me on this but I think it's a 10 the eye is large enough for me to still see but it is thin enough to get those stitches hidden and the last thing you're going to need is fabric right um, like I said, you could use scraps with this. It is very good for that. It makes some beautiful scrappy looking quilts and such. Beautiful. Or you could be a little more methodical and buy yourself some fat quarters or, you know, yardage of fabric, but you're going to need that fabric. So what do you do with all of this stuff? How do you get it all together? That's our next step. So the first part to assembly your hexagon in whatever pattern that you've decided to use is to cut out your paper templates. That's if you haven't bought the pre-cut templates, you'll need to cut these. Uh, again, I use the Fisker die cuts. So for this video, I went ahead and cut a bunch of them. So you wanna get those prepped. The second step is to cut your fabric to the template. Now I will tell you that they make acrylic templates that you can place onto the fabric that include the quarter inch seam and you can trace those and then cut it or you can rotary blade along the side of it but they do make those i don't have that <clears throat> so we're using the paper template another option that you have is to use your ruler and you could line up your quarter inch seam or whatever size seam you like and you use on your cutting mat use your rotary blade and cut all the sides but for me I just use plain old scissors. Uh, I find that it's not worth stressing about accuracy. It's, you know, we just don't have time for that. So you wanna take your paper template and you want to place it on the wrong side of your fabric. So you can see this is my right and that is my wrong. So you place the paper down on the wrong side, making sure that you have enough room to cut around your seam. Then you want to take your needle and you want to pin it so that it stays to your fabric okay and again take your scissors and cut around i do like to cut a little larger than a quarter inch seam because it makes it a lot easier for me to hold so after you've cut them out this is what you'll have and notice there is not any rhyme or reason um, to accuracy with mine again it's not worth stressing about but I have got my corners. So then you go ahead and we're going to begin basting. Now, as far as basting goes, some people like to use 
um, a glue pen, a fabric glue pen, or um, there's a popular one I'm told is called a sew line glue pen. I'm told it's very popular, a lot of people like it, and it makes it so you don't have to hand stitch it. You just simply glue along the um, paper and then fold the fabric down just like you would if you were sewing your uh, basting. My mother taught me how to do it this way. I taught my daughter how to do it this way, and this is just my preferred method, but there are a lot of methods out there that, that work really well. So what we're going to do now is start to baste. So you wanna grab your thread and your needle, get your needle threaded, and get yourself a quilter's knot. If you don't know how to make a quilter's knot, I'll put a link in the description um, to this video where it's on my website. The link will take you there and you can learn how to do a quilter's knot. Uh, then you want to take your hexagon with your fabric, fold it on the first side. Do a, a little press here. Get that seam in, okay? Then you want to take at the corner and fold it again. This will give you a mitered look, okay? Now I will tell you at this point, if you go counterclockwise, always go counterclockwise. If you go clockwise, always go clockwise. So to get this started, I simply go up underneath the fabric and pull it through to the, to the knot. <clears throat> then you want to go underneath the fold on the other side and come through. And then you want to do it again so it'll hold that corner down. Then fold down the next side, making sure you have that miter. All right. Go across and through one side and out the other of that corner. Be sure not to grab the paper. You only want to make sure you're sewing the fabric. And you want to go around all the corners. Now the reason that I put the needle on this on the wrong side so that it's on the inside is so that while I'm basting it the thread doesn't catch the head of the needle and there we go I think I got two more yep two more corners and as you can see if I got a quarter inch, it's just a little harder to hold for me. I got clumsy hands. Last corner. Now at this point, you could stop here. You don't have to go to the first corner. It's not necessary. Save your thread and not do it. But I'm a creature habit and I've always done it this way so it's just I, ha I feel unfinished if I don't get it done so I do that corner again and then I just do a little back stitch okay now you could pre-do all your fabric to your hexagons like this and then sit down and do all the basting. Then you can sit and do all the basting and then do put them all together. But for this video, I'm going to go, I went ahead and pre-done the second ring or the first ring of my flower for instructional purposes. So I'm going to show you how to put the hexes now together on the next step. So the next step is stitching the hexagons together. Now remember, I'm using the Grandmother's Flower Garden as my pattern, but it doesn't matter what pattern you use, the way that you stitch these things together is the same, okay? Now if you look here, I have my finished flower garden, um, and it has the center, the first ring, and the second ring. So we're working on a new one, which will have the center and the six that I have all basted here. 
I have, through time and doing this a while, I have actually put together a pattern or a pathway for you to stitch. This not only allows you time saved, but also a little bit of thread. So you'll be able to find this again on my website and the link will be in the description for you. So let's get started. Again, you want to get your needle and your thread now the thread here is best if you match the thread color to your fabric, but for instructional purposes, I went ahead and stayed with white so that you might be able to see it better, I'm hoping. Um, <clears throat> so again, you wanna thread your needle, quilter's knot. You wanna take your center hexi and the first hexi that you're gonna sew on. And you wanna put them right sides together, lining up the corners, okay? In the first corner, you want to take and you want to go through here with your needle all the way until you meet that knot, okay? And you want to only try and grab a couple of threads worth and don't get the paper. The whole time you're stitching these together, you do not want to grab the paper because then it'll be hard to get the paper out, which we'll do here when we're finished. So I got, you also want to stitch twice into that corner in every corner because what that'll do is it will help hold that in place. All right, then you're just simply going about an eighth of an inch away and only catching a couple of threads. You want to go across using a whip stitch. So I go from this side back. Some people like to go this way. It's whatever way you want. But again, you want to keep it consistent going clockwise or, or counterclockwise. And you want to only take a couple of stitches, I mean a couple of threads, about an eighth of an inch apart. And you just want to go along using this whip stitch along the edge. front to back and front to back. Got a little close on that one. which really isn't a big deal if we get too close together. Being accurate on an eighth of an inch is not necessary. You just don't wanna to be too far. And make sure you get both sides of that, of, um, get both of the hexes. You're going to do this with every single one of them, but I'm going to show you and adding the next one. And following that path, we're actually going to stitch up and out away from the circle. snag the corner on that one and that happens two more stitches Whoop. remember I have clumsy hands okay we're back at that corner so again you're gonna want to stitch twice help hold that corner in place doesn't leave a gap later. Of course, I've lost my thread. So we're gonna re-thread it real quick. There we go. Now, one of the things I just love about English paper piecing is that everything is so small and everything can be packed away and you can take it wherever you like. 
in the car, at a doctor's office, wherever. It all fits together. Okay, so now you can see I've stitched it all together. The first, the first one, this is my center, this is my first one out. Now notice that you can see some of my stitches. When you match that um, thread, it, it hides it easier and then maybe I need to take a little bit less of uh, the fabric. So you wanna open it up and you're gonna grab your second hexagon. And it goes like this, okay? So we're gonna stitch out. Oh, let's see, which way is my, there we go. We're gonna stitch out. All right, now, so again, you wanna do, we're in the corner, so you wanna do two stitches in that corner. Helps hold it in place and doesn't allow it to gap there. And then you just simply grab a couple, one or two threads worth Eighth of an inch apart, both sides, all the way across. The one thing I really like about English paper piecing is it's very distressing. You can sit down on your favorite chair in your living room or on your couch and sit and stitch while you watch television or listen to an audio book or a podcast or some more videos and just sit back and relax takes your mind off of things now again if you get a little closer than an eighth of an inch it is not the end of the world Make sure you don't grab that paper. That's a little deep. There we go. I usually hold this a little closer. It's a little difficult to see, but it's the same over and over. Well, this time we're getting that second hexagon on. And at the end of this one, we're gonna go ahead, and I have learned a new knot. And it's kind of funny to say, but it's called the knicker knot. And I'm going to post a video on my website if you're interested. But it's a, basically a figure eight knot. And it holds, it makes sure to hold the thread so it doesn't come undone. So I get to the end here, and even if you're not using a knicker knot, you do want to knot this off before you cut it. And then I'll show you how to add the next one. I'm at the corner, so first before my knot, do two stitches in the corner. And then I'm gonna do my knicker knot. Now I've just learned this. So I'm a little clumsy at it still. And then you cut your thread and you have your first or your second hexagon added. Now at this point you want to go across. The wonderful thing about paper is it folds. 
okay? All right, so here we are. Fold this, fold this in half, take your center and match it to the next one. You're gonna take your needle with your thread, you're gonna go twice in, in the corner, stitch across, open her back up, add your next hexi, two in the corner, stitch out, knot and cut. And you'll do this all the way around until you've added all six of your hexagons for your first ring. After the first ring is done, this is the back side of one that I have finished. You'll see that after the first ring is done, you can take out that center piece of paper. This allows it to be a lot more easier to manipulate when you're trying to do this. And the key is, if the hexagon is completely encased or circled around, then you can take the paper out. So after you get this whole ring on, you take this out. After you get the second ring on, all of these are enclosed so you can take that paper out. Until they're covered, you don't wanna take the, the paper out. And that's English paper piecing. Although the shape may change or the pattern may change, the process doesn't change. You cut, you baste, and you stitch. It's that easy and it's so much fun. I truly hope you were inspired here. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button below. We really appreciate it. If you wanna see future postings of videos, go ahead and hit subscribe with the little bell to let you know that we've done it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below also in the comment section or you can visit us at our website at www.haloinspired.com. There's a contact tab. And on that website, you will also find that we've done a blog style tutorial on English paper piecing there. You can find it easy, more easy, or is that a word? More easy on the list of inspirations tab. It just makes it really easy to navigate there. Until next time, may you continue to be inspired, productive, and joyful, and never stop making your dreams in quilting come true. Now let's go quilt.